resistance, as I said, you know, the, the, the bar incident that I mentioned with the two proclamations, this resistance often took the form of ritual also, because the one place where the Maharajas could keep the British in their place, say, tell them that you are actually smaller than us, was in the court, was in the, in the avenue or in the space of ceremony and ritual. So, for instance, in multiple princely states, these uh, the British residents, who were like the local agents of the company, the East India Company, and then later Queen Victoria, uh, they would insist that they would only enter the darbar wearing their shoes, and the rajas would say, no, nobody enters the darbar wearing shoes. And these battles would continue for generations at times. In Hyderabad, it continued for two generations. Two nizams refused to allow shoes in their darbars. Ultimately, there was a little boy who was on the throne, three or four-year-old kid, uh, Mehboob Ali Khan the sixth. At that time, they finally came to a compromise because the boy obviously didn't have an opinion on this. And uh, the Diwan gave the British something, the British gave the Diwan something, and that's how the British got to wear their shoes. Often, British residents could be manipulated. It wasn't that just the, uh, the Rajas were being manipulated, there was counter manipulation. Uh, people knew, you know, who the British resident was sleeping with, where they had illegitimate children. In Trivandrum, you know, resident Cotton, who appears in, in your book as well, Mr. Palat, there's this uh, wonderful saying in Cochin and Travanco, in Malayalam, they say, Metail cotton on which is that, you know, in your bed is there some cotton, because Mr. Cotton was quite promiscuous and had a habit of jumping from bed to bed. And having this kind of knowledge, so it wasn't just the British picking intelligence on the princes, the princes also knew where the weak spots were. And if the one agent of the British in your court could be manipulated, well, that was one way of making sure that imperial policy uh, suited you, in, you know, as and when you wanted. In Indore, a Maharani sends the, uh, the British resident a basket of fruit, very sweet fruit, how nice. And then the man starts eating the fruit, and then he realizes there's actually gold coins hidden under the fruit. And then he gets very upset. He says, is this a bribe? How dare you send me these gold coins? The Maharani very coolly says, were you expecting more? You can just ask. You know, there's no need to throw such a drama. Just tell me if you want more. Other ways of manipulation in Jaipur, their treaty with the Maharaja very clearly said that any revenue above the sum of 40 lakhs, the, the British had to get a slice of it. And Maharaja of Jaipur was uh, Ram Singh II, a very fine photographer himself. He was definitely a modernizer when it came to setting up schools, colleges, roads, gas lights in the streets. All of those things were fine. But he would not, he would refuse to modernize his, the collection of revenue in his kingdom because he realized that if I modernize the collection of revenue and create annual reports, the British will know what I'm earning. So he deliberately kept revenue collection old-fashioned in the local languages so that they would not be able to access it. And his revenue was always 39 lakhs, 38.5 lakhs. Always under 40 by a small margin, never over 40. And the British knew this. They knew that he had up to 60 lakhs in revenue, but they could do nothing. Subscribe to Sarmaya and be a part of the stories and conversations around art, history and culture.